first of all, I want to thank Howard and the, the East Brunswick Historical Society for inviting me today and thank all of you for your interest in coming out today. Um, I think it is a pretty important topic and very timely uh, to today, as you know. And I'm here to talk to you about um, the 1918 influenza pandemic, especially in New Jersey. Um, and before we do that, I want you to imagine what life was like in um, New Jersey. I uh, talked about the impact of the 1918 influenza pandemic in New Jersey, specifically in New Jersey. And uh, it started all when I was teaching sixth graders about 12 years ago and noticed that there was a, a caption in the textbook about the pandemic and that 20 to 50 million people had died worldwide and that was all that was said in the textbook. So that got me interested in pursuing this topic and in particular here in New Jersey. Um, the, um, my, my thesis basically here is to let you know that the state of New Jersey had an infrastructure in place that was able to handle the influenza pandemic. They didn't realize it at the time, but they did. And the other part of this, though, is that despite the great number of deaths due to influenza, uh, the Great War does take precedence over most everything else, and I'll, I'll share more about that with you in the, in the program. And much of what we can learn from the handling of the 1918 influenza pandemic here in New Jersey is very much still applicable to today. Now, I'm going to take you on a tour. The Spanish flu is really just the name for it. Uh, it's really uh, the 1918 influenza pandemic. Uh, it uh, killed 50 to 100 million people worldwide, about 675,000 Americans, 22,000 people in New Jersey. And it was a pandemic, meaning it was worldwide, in that it um, killed so many people throughout the world at the time within about a six to eight week period, way more than uh, World War I uh, that was going on at the same time. Um, I want to start first with Camp Dix, because this is where people first started noticing that the flu was, was taking place. Um, right around the middle of September, um, the uh, men were coming down with the flu at Camp Dix. Uh, over 4,000 were stricken within a week um, of this time. And by October 21st, there's 7,000 cases of influenza at Camp Dix. That's, that's a pretty large number, causing 863 deaths. And they, they had to turn the barracks into field hospitals. There was just no place to put these men. Now, what's interesting, though, is that the, um, the outbreak in Camp Dix was an opportunity for the health officials from the State Board of Health to uh, go down to Camp Dix and find out what was going on to make several observations so that they could report out to physicians especially about what was coming. They had an idea that this was probably going to spread. The flu exists uh, because of a virus and uh, the virus at the time was uh, being spread a lot through a troop movement. Uh, troops throughout the world were being transported to Europe for the fight in, uh, in the Great War. And uh, so the germ was spreading to, uh, to many people, not only to troops, but to the civilians as well. So it was a flu that um, at the time they knew that it could have been caused by a virus, uh, but they weren't sure. They might have thought it was caused by other pathogens. Uh, Pfeiffer's bacilli is another one that was uh, floating around at the time. But uh, the, obviously they have since learned that the flu is caused by a virus is of the state and what happened there. And I want to begin actually at Camp Dix. I want to introduce you to a man, Private Harry T. Presley, who uh, caught the flu in March of 1918, but it was a very mild form of the flu. He was ahead of desk job, so he really wasn't taken off duty. Um, and he does recover, but he becomes what they later term as uh, being a, having the, the seed uh, for the virus come the following fall. In, uh, in 1918, and he actually comes down with the flu again mm -hmm. in September of 1918. Only this time, he's in Brest, France, mm -hmm. where which was the main entry point for American troops coming into Europe. So, um, so you can see he ends up um, becoming one of the carriers of, of the virus. Um, it ended um, probably between December of 19 and January of 1919, although there were some more cases of the flu afterwards in 1919, but most of the flu occurred between mid-September to uh, right around 
Armistice Day, which was November 11th, so right about two month period. In, uh, in New Jersey, so that's kind of neat too. So anyway, the handling of the 1918 influenza pandemic does indeed teach us a lot of valuable lessons. Um, communication, collaboration are key. I mean, people have got to work together, and especially the municipalities coming together to, to figure out how, well, how to handle it. And right away, too. You can't wait. You've got to get together right away. Um, the State Department of Health, now that was key, too. They mobilized efforts immediately. And the other municipalities followed suit, and that's key as well. You've got to... You know, you might not always agree, like Gillen of Newark, but you've got to follow what the state says. This is what we're doing. We're going to put the whole state under quarantine. you got to follow it. That's the way it's going to be. Um, now, also, the state of New Jersey supported research. Well, what we learned in the state of New Jersey is that we have to come together as a uh, people, um, our municipalities uh, have to work very closely with the state government and state board of health um, and follow the um, wishes of the state board of health. If a quarantine is called, then one, it must be followed. And to work very closely with one another, that people have to work carefully with one another, uh, communicate, collaborate, and um, to, in order to curb the, the influenza from spreading even further. And New Jersey actually was one of the few states that really did um, curb influenza and prevent further deaths.